expandable technologies and the lateral approaches have been a big part of minimally invasive evolution over the last uh, decade or so and has made a huge impact in the way we do spine surgery and, and it re achieves agile balance. So that having been said, let's see if I can get the talk to go here. Um, Ashley, I'm not, oh, there yep. it is. So, you should have control of the screen. So let's start with a case. Um, let's see. In our first, so I always like to start with a case, kind of gets us all on the same page, kind of know what we're talking about. So 68-year-old female, prior spondylolisthesis stenosis, prior laminectomy, had a strange peak spacer put in like uh, that was popular for a long time. We've all put a few in, I think. And the typical kind of uh, lower extremity weakness and sciatica here are the films to sort of run through. You can see there's a sagittal uh, mismatch, particularly at a four or five in the laminectomy area. There's a wide laminectomy defect and a very slight uh, pelvic parameter uh, lumbar lordosis mismatch with an ODI. And there is kind of the supine MRI. You can see the spacer. You can see the post-laminectomy defect. And I think we all understand this is a very typical patient, post-laminectomy, spinal instability type patient. But there is definitely a flat or, or, or kyphotic segment at the prior treatment. So there are a lot of ways to do it. We talk about fixed deformities. We talk about mobile deformities. I think most of us would agree this is extreme for a PSO. PSO is typically reserved for rigid deformities. That's a probably discussion for another topic. But anterior column release as a surgical technique for minimally invasive spine surgery, that's something that we've talked about a lot in the last 10 years. And now with expandable cages, help us do ACRs because a lot of times when we release the anterior column and we put in a fixed or mo a monolithic hyperlordotic cage, it can be a problem because a lot of times it's very collapsed. Pounding in a 30 degree wedge can be particularly problematic. We want to lift it in and as we lift it, we rotate it back through its lordosis. So expandable cages, particularly in the lateral way, are very useful. And so from that perspective, it's a wonderful tool for lateral plane, lateral approaches and for sagittal plane correction. So again, here you can see the typical AL resection type of technique and what we can achieve. And instead of pounding in wedges to hold that and to lift that as we've taken the ALL, expandables are the way of doing it. So in this case, we uh, uh, dock more anteriorly, like an anterior psoas type approach or an O-lift type approach, depending on what you want at four or five and some type of a protection to protect the vessels. And then this is the typical view. Now, in this particular case, we had the patient position lateral and we become very enamored in uh, gaining experience with single stage positioning and image guidance. So here you can see us approaching with an OLIF, a kind of diagram showing the setup of the OR, and we're also simultaneously instrumenting from the back. And so, obviating the need for a 360 and a turn. So the first thing we do in a higher grade spawning like this is we like to put our upper screws in because those are the easy ones to put in. And this begins to give us control of the spine as you can see on this fluoroscopic flow. Once we have a temporary rod in, we don't, and this is a post laminectomy defect, we, we've taken out the prior peak spacer. Then what we do is we begin to act as in a standard kind of anterior psoas or, you know, o, o lift type approach. And then uh, we go ahead and do our ALL resection and complete that. And then ultimately, you can see we have a common combination. We have our extended reduction screws in, and we have uh, the lateral cage, and we've got the lateral uh, anterior release going. Now, with the hyperlordotic implants, we expand the cage, and we always advocate putting a screw in because, unfortunately, as you the expandable technologies, as you expand and reduce the lower dose and, and bring back the lower doses, it tends to want to walk forward like a watermelon seed. It tends to migrate a little bit, simply put. So from that perspective, fixating with a screw is a very useful thing. You put one or two, but nevertheless, a fixation screw is a good idea to prevent uh, perioperative, intraoperative, and postoperative migration. And so here you can see ultimately what that looks like. And what you don't really appreciate is we're reducing, we lift a little bit with the cage and then we reduce the screw a little bit. We lift more with the cage and we reduce. So we're doing a simultaneously anterior and posterior column or translational and vertical plane reduction. And so there you can see sort of what that looks like. We intraoperatively reduced, re translated backwards and uh, uh, achieved a probably even maybe a little too much lordosis in truth. This is one of our earlier cases, but you can see the technique 
and the, the benefit that expandable cages, especially when combined with posterior column control, uh, can provide. And here you can see the immediate post-op films, and you can see the, the, about tw the significant hyperlordotic 20-degree ACR type of release, and there's a, a one-year follow-up film settled down, of course, as you would imagine, a little bit, so it looks a little bit more reasonable. And ultimately, the pelvic mismatch and the pelvic tilt has corrected, which for us is a big thing. So we've now become very clear, I think, on saying that uh, even on a single level or a, a, a single, uh, uh, we always try to achieve the maximum low doses to reduce the incidence of PJK, uh, incidence of delayed deformity, and also just getting the pelvic tilt and pelvic parameters to line up, which for us at least, and a lot of the literature from the SRS and the various study groups have shown to correlate with a better long-term one-year and two-year ODI score. And so that's the, and this, uh, just I'll fly through the second one real quick. There are a variety of expandable technologies out there. There are cages that not only expand vertically, but expand horizontally or, or in an AP dimension to increase the footprint and the size of it. This is an example of, again, we have a lot of these post-laminectomy defects down here. So this is another patient who had ISP, 65-year-old with dextroscoliosis. Prior ISP, as you can see that, um, really scoliosis is not a huge deal, but again, ODI, uh, uh, the ODI score and the pelvic tilt mismatch from the prior slides. And there's the film, typical three, four, four, five. So structural deficits, neurological compression, and flat back, and basically flat as a pancake. Here you can see a intraop water flow of us putting in the cage, expanding it vertically, and also um, uh, first we do a horiz it expands horizontally and then expands upwards, so a different type of cage. And here you can see the advantage of that is you can see we can achieve through a small 13 millimeter initial quarter, very wide expansion because even to this day, subsidence of expandable, subsidence of lateral cages, we used to have very small cages, 18s and 19s. Those would subside in a lateral. Now we're pushing the contact surfaces out and allowing for a large wide center graph to be post filled. And you can see the advantages of that. So not only do we expand vertically, we expand horizontally, and then we can post fill the cages here. You can kind of see the mechanism and how we do that through a, uh, through, through the, a single inserter technique. And then, um, so sorry, no glitch. And then, oh, so now you see we put two in and again, single stage, uh, we put uh, the screws in and ultimately we, we complete bilateral fixation. And so you can see uh, a unilateral fixation, sorry, because you already had ISPs in. And there's the the three month post op and and moving forward, and then there's the there's the the six month post op as you can see there. So ultimately, these cages are are useful. There, there's uh, there's vertically expanding, vertically lordotic correcting expanding. There's uh, simultaneous anterior posterior expansion. So there's a whole variety of new technological tools that you know very akin to the thing you raise your car up with to, to change the tires, but still nevertheless, from a surgical carpentry point of view, very helpful. So when we combine it with the ACR techniques, we're now able to achieve incredible corrections. And this is our own personal series of ACRs and corrections. And um, we're trying to get this published right now, but you can see out of our 72 patients, the surgical times, the fusion rates, the ODI changes are excellent. And again, as we've gotten better, our surgical times are better. We're doing a lot of these single stages. And our length of stays are down to about one, one and a half days, uh, two and a half days from our earlier series. And this is probably the most important slide uh, of this. If you look at the lordotic correction angle, combined with ACR, we're able to achieve very large corrections. 19 degrees is our average. Six months, it subsides a little bit. And at 12 months, we're able to hold about a 17 degree segmental correction. And the expandables obviously generate a lot more because it sort of lifts it into its position and we can control it with the posterior screws at times in single stage. But the point is, is that we can achieve near PSO level type corrections, which is something that we could not do uh, in the past with just simple laterals. Some of our laterals were kind of flat. So combined with posterior osteotomies, minimally invasive reduction, and now the expandables, we can achieve 20, 23 degrees intraoperatively and ultimately maintain around uh, 17 to 18 degrees at one year after subsidence. So why we think that's important, because that affects meaningful pelvic tilt change, which again for us is the most strong single level uh, x-ray correlate of a good ODI score down the line. And again, there's a lot of literature to suggest now from the SRS and the uh, ISSG and other study groups that by achieving the pelvic tilt correction or the compensate or getting them to get rid of their 
for a pelvic tilt compensation over rehab, physical therapy, and time in one year, those patients correlate with the best outcomes, which is why we really enjoy using the fixed expandable cages. We don't have to pound it in. We lift the bones. We rotate the spine, and we achieve the corrections and sagittal balance parameters that we want. And this is in line with Bruce Barnia's review of ACRs. They get in a, in a meta review of the series about 19 degree correction. And that's definitely what we're seeing. We're seeing a little bit more in truth uh, with um, uh, these expandable cages. And of course, like everything else, you have to follow them for a year or two to see how much you actually get. But 19 degrees appears to be sort of what we're all reporting in terms of what we can achieve with these expandable cages. So simply put, when we use expandable hyperlordotic cages with anterior column release, we're achieving statistical non-significant correlations between lordotic change and ODI scores, whereas pelvic tilt strongly correlated with our ODI scores at one year. And the expandable cages, even within our own internal series, uh, typically achieve meaningful pelvic tilt changes more frequently. Uh, there's a strong trend, P of 0.1, uh, to uh, better uh, pelvic tilt and ODI corrections, uh, ODI improvements, I should say, over one year. And with that, that's that. That's it. So I uh, hope uh, that provided some information and uh, gave us some insight as to why these fancy new widgets may be very helpful in our carpentry techniques. But um, thank you very much for having me, Jeff and, and Rod and everybody. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. How much bony work do you do posteriorly? And do you do it through a midline incision or bilateral pyramidian incisions? And do you do pontes, et cetera, facetectomies? Yeah. As you know, a lot of times in a very collapsed segment, you have to really truly do a ponte, you know, sets and then come through a, a partial laminar cut and take the bases and top of the spinous process. And that, that was always a problem. That was always a bit of a problem for us because it's hard to do that through a minimally invasive approach. It really is, especially if the sp spinous processes are already kissing, it's hard to ban them into lordosis. So that's why, Chol, we've, we've kind of gone with this combined technique because we often will have two small tubes of bilateral paramedians and we'll have two small tubes uh, or, or portals in the back. And then we just take an osteotome and we cut off the IAP. The IAP as it comes out, we just take the typical osteotome and make those like, you know, small wedge cuts and take off some bone, get some bone for fusion, so on and so forth. And then I, I'll often do that with my loops or uh, if, uh, or, you know, just with my eyes, but usually with my loops. And then we start expanding the front. And as we lift up, we'll see that the facets will decouple. And if they're not, I'll go in there with some paddles and try to break the facet up a little bit more in osteotomes. And then as we lift up, a lot of times I've come to see that we don't need to take the spinous process. In other words, we don't have to do a full ponte, which is nice. It's just basically, you know, a Smith Pete or like whatever the right name is, Schwab type one or type two osteotomies. So with that, our need to do true Schwab three pontiostomy, uh, ponte type osteotomies has gone down. But as you know, sometimes the spinal processes are so kissed together that they're stiff. So a lot of times we sneak across with like a, wi a wider osteotome and just essentially cut through the inner spinous ligament to release it without having to do, or maybe take a little bit of bone and crack the bone to do that release without doing a true physical resection because, um, you know, otherwise uh, the single stage positions are, are more difficult. And so that simultaneous anterior posterior release is uh, kind of that's how we've been doing it. Or And we're, we're definitely modifying as we go, but yeah, as I think that's the problem we all have. You can't get good lateral corrections if it's stiff in the back. You guys hear us? Yeah, Jeff, look good. How's it going, guys? Great talk, Larry. Um, Thank you. I personally think that the, you know, there are certain technologies in MIS that help us to sort of advance to the next level. And I think expandable technologies certainly are one of those technologies. I mean, simply because what we're trying to do is to create stability in the, in the intervertebral disc space. And before, if we wanted to put a, uh, an A-lift style cage, into a disc space, we would have to make an A-lift style incision. And so I think sort of that evolution of having smaller PLIF style cages where 
we just put in static cages, and it really didn't do that much beyond that. Now we're able to not only increase the intervertebral disk space height, but also increase the footprint as well. You know, so I think that that um, the demonstration of um, any type of expandable cage, I think, once you start using it, it's hard to actually go back to a, a normal static cage. Um, Larry, do you do you do any uh, OLIFs, or is it simply yeah. just a lateral? No, uh, we do OLIFs. We do sometimes. Uh, with a vascular surgeon, we've been doing more and more a four, five, five, one combination OLIPS uh, just for single staging, and we really enjoyed that. You know, uh, I'm, it's for a workflow instead of going the rotisserie a lift lateral. Now we're starting to do more and more OLIPS, but I've been doing them with our vascular surgeon, which has been uh, a great experience. And we're gonna have a great uh, discussion and a panel um, regarding OLIPS and X lifts. But do you think that a, a specific OLIF type of cage put into an oblique like trajectory, do you think that's necessary or do you typically tend to just go pure lateral type of cage? I think the problem is with the lateral, obviously it's very angular specific, right? The way the plane in which it expands. So I think having cages specific to OLIF approaches or the more oblique approaches is really important because sometimes it's simply very difficult or not possible to move your hand up that, that OLIF maneuver, so to speak. And even when you do, sometimes um, you can't quite get it perfectly right. So you're kind of introducing, if you understand, a straight lateral expandable will introduce by definition a tilt, you know, a, a coronal tilt, right? A rotational coronal tilt. So having specific cages for OLIF its approaches is important. And particularly as you do L5, S1, true OLIF approaches, you got to have a specific cage for that one because that one won't tolerate an angular cage because it will just make it really funky and weird. So for that, because that you we don't really have a straight on approach to 5-1 uh, ever, in, uh, rarely, if ever, uh, in, in, in a L5, S1 OLIF. So I think they're particularly a specific object designed for angular angular insertion is is critical like you know just like our t lift cages have a bias lordosis i think expandables for olif have to also have the bias lordosis so it fits the angle of insertion the angle of the final implant position yeah, i think ultimately we're going to have expandable cages that correct all sorts of deformities not only in the sagittal plane the coronal plane but also in the axial plane as well you know so and patient specific uh, expandables is, is on the horizon for sure so